Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. Thanks for coming tonight. Hey everyone, it's great to see you. I'm Hillary of the Last Wilderness League. We're gonna get started in just a minute. Hey everyone, we're going to get started in just a minute. All right, well, let's see, we we're about a minute in, so I'll just start, get started on our intros. Um, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Hillary Stamper and I am the Director of Member Engagement for Alaska Wilderness League. I'm calling in tonight from Half Moon Bay, California, the traditional lands of the Ohlone people. And I'm so thrilled to see so many of you here tonight for our first Geography of Hope of Fall, Caribou Across North America, Stories from the Land with naturalist and tracker Sue Morse. Just a few quick housekeeping items. As you can see, tonight's event is a webinar and all participants are muted for the duration of the program to make it easier for everyone to hear. Um, I am going to compile your questions and we will address them at the end of the webinar during the Q&A part of the show. If for any reason you miss part of tonight's program or you just wanna watch it again, we will be recording and we'll provide that link um, probably today or tomorrow. So with that, I'm so excited to introduce our presentation team, Sophie Veltrop and Sue Morse. Hi, good evening, everyone. So we are coming to you live from Vermont this evening at the Northeast Wilderness Trust headquarters, where I serve as the outreach manager. And though we're located in a very different corner of the United States than the Alaska Wilderness League, um, as a fellow wilderness conservation organization, uh, we are just so glad to be partnering with Alaska Wilderness League tonight on this presentation and to know that we have such amazing allies on the West Coast who are working day in and day out towards a wilder world. So in addition to Northeast Wilderness Trusts being connected to Sue Morse because she is an incredible advocate for wildlife and for wild places, she actually protected her own land here in Vermont with a forever wild conservation easement with us for which we're so grateful. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce you to Susan Morse. Sue is an ecologist, professional wildlife tracker, educator, and published author. She is the founder and science director of Keeping Track, a nonprofit that serves to engage communities in monitoring wildlife and their habitats. And teams that Sue has trained have conserved more than 40,000 acres of land throughout North America. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Well, I, I want to say to start with how thrilled I am to be here. I, I am a member of Alaska Wilderness League and of course, Northeast Wilderness Trust. And uh, so I do whatever I can in my humble way to support the cause of wilderness. But I want to put it out there to each and every one of you. If you are not a member, uh, especially tonight of the Alaska Wilderness League, please join. Uh, you'll learn tonight why that's so critically important, and I am proud to be a member of the Alaska Wilderness League. So, so this has been prepared by keeping track for the Alaska Wilderness League special series, Geography of Hope. And of course, I am so grateful tonight to be uh, joined by Northeast Wilderness Trust, without whom I couldn't do this, because truth be known, I don't even use the computer. <laughs> yeah, they're all different 
they all look the same from a distance, but boy, when you get close, they're all personalities. <laughs> yeah. I love them. But before we start, I, I want to give an official and heartfelt thanks to my colleagues, Perry Reinhardt, Thomas Dukeshire, and Lightworks Incorporated for their help in uh, helping me with the technical aspects of preparing this uh, webinar. And this has been made possible by the Bessie Foundations, and uh, I'm so grateful to them. This is their third year of supporting Keeping Tracks endeavors to do these webinars in a COVID world. So thank you so much, all of you. So I fell in love with caribou, really. I mean, I've been studying mountain lions for decades and, and uh, bobcats. I have the longest data set on bobcats probably of anyone. Uh, you know, 45 plus years, black bears and so on. So I, I'm familiar with studying wildlife, but all my life I've been fascinated with the idea of caribou as much because I've been fascinated with the world they live in. And it is just impressively wild. There's nothing else like it in North America. This is the Ungava Peninsula where I first met my first caribou. And this is at the edge of the Tago where the forest uh, uh, edge meets the tundra, but not quite. And the Laurentian shield is a big player here. So this is the land of the Canadian shield, which you may all want to look up on a vast, vast geologic uh, domain that uh, really uh, governs what we see here. Very, very metamorphic, folded, rumpled, uh, wonderful landscape. And I'm going to read selected passages from a speech I gave at a caribou conference some years ago. So it just helps me be more uh, efficient in sharing some of my thoughts. I am powerfully attracted to the Arctic barrens, boreal forests and mountains of the north. The tougher the going, the more exquisite and magnificent the tenacity of life. In Inuit language, Nuna means the land, but not in our simple and utilitarian meaning. Nuna means much more than that, conveying a meaning more vast than all of Nunavik and Nunavut and the Northwest Territories combined. Nuna is the land that includes the caribou, all the birds and all other animals, as well as the people, all sustained and intertwined physically and spiritually as equal partners in life's journey. Wow, I just couldn't get over this landscape. You know, when early uh, white settlers and, and explorers and, and industrialists, if you are pre-industrialists from afar, saw this landscape, they called it barren. And they thought it was unimaginably bleak and devoid of life. They couldn't have been more wrong. It's stunning. And in Ungava, the Ungava Peninsula with Hudson Straits to the north and Hudson's Bay to the west and the Labrador coast to the east, the Atlantic Ocean, it's, it's an extraordinary place. And is home to, at one time, when I was first there, the largest concentration of caribou in the world. Caribou that pass through here were part of, depending on where you were on the peninsula, either the George River herd, or for my research purposes, the Leaf River herd, the combined total of which was well over a million animals. And so indeed, they're there. And I got excited when I saw my first sign of my friends, the caribou. And, you know, it's everywhere. They're there. Thousands of these animals pass through. Hundreds of thousands of these animals pass through, and that's the way the world goes around. Caribou roam the whole of this land, seeking summer and winter range, safe calving grounds, nutritious forage, and relief from insects and predators over thousands of miles and thousands of years. 
Ranger fir tyrandus is both from Latin and Greek and means to range and wild and untamed. Indeed, the very essence of this great animal. To sit for hours or days watching and waiting for caribou, observing countless birds fly south and not see a single caribou, this is the truth. Then to suddenly discover thousands of them trotting along a distant ridge is one of the most profound and moving experiences of my life. Biologist Ann Gunn says it best. Caribou are the heartbeat of the tundra. Where I found them in the Ungava Peninsula and elsewhere as I studied them across the Barrens in Canada, um, I would find the pinch points, the places in the water system, streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, where they would choose the easiest way to get across these water bodies. They're great swimmers, but they knew that if they could make it easier, it would be better. They're very, very capable swimmers. Their hooves are like paddles, well suited for swimming. Their coats, especially their winter coat guard hairs are hollow and provide a wonderful buoyancy to their body mass, helps keep them afloat. And, you know, well, this bull, this bull is saying to the cows all around him, and the cows, by the way, have antlers too, but the bull, you see him there, he's just recently shed his velvet. And I think he's saying, girls, would you please surround me more? I don't like what I'm looking at. Even the youngsters are great swimmers and uh, beside their mothers will make these swimming journeys. And the only time that it's really tricky is in the spring when they're coming to their calving grounds and yearling calves with their mothers uh, really struggle in the very turbulent, dangerous waters of flood swollen, uh, you know, conditions. This is uh, the Leaf River herd swimming across Charlie Lake. And I should tell you that for two whole days, nonstop, linear streams of these animals were moving along the ridge lines around where I was camping. And as I was leaving camp on my final day, I asked my pilot to tip his wing and let me say goodbye to them because they had been nonstop swimming across that lake. This is cool. This is a lead cow and the cows are where it's at. They know where stuff is and where to go and where not to go. And they are, if you will, the wisdom of the herd. And uh, I saw nothing but thousands of animals moving along a ridge line a mile from me, but nothing near me. I was sitting in some black spruce trees, just a small copse of them surrounded my musk egg and barrens and Nothing was happening. Well, then I saw something white, and that was her mane. And from a distance, I looked at it through my heavy, uh, my, my camera lens and saw that it was indeed a caribou. And she was very carefully, one step at a time, turning her head, sniffing, pausing, looking very, very cautious. She was making her way from that ridge line on a trail right by me. Within a half an hour, the entire herd came off that ridge line and followed her trail step for step and did the exact same journey. I, I was floored. I had tears in my eyes. I could hardly focus on the pictures, but here they were. And you know, all you had to do was be quiet. <laughs> I call this variations on the antler theme, that's a cow on the left, a calf in the middle, and a bull in the background. Once in a while they'll get a sense of you being there, so they'll go more quickly. I'm not sure about that. And When one does that, the others will follow because they release a scent from their glands that triggers the others to know, hmm, there's something funny going on, but not so bad that they don't allow you to love them and enjoy them and photograph them. 
the bulls are magnificent. Everybody gets that. Uh, but they're not the only game in town. But you'll know the bulls by their big white manes in the fall, especially in late September and October, and their antlers stripped of their velvet. I'll talk about that later. Cows, on the other hand, have smaller antlers, which they keep longer than the bulls, but they're gorgeous animals and very, very much a part of the security of the herd. They know where to go. They're aware that someone's there, me. They're not sure about that. The calves are extraordinary. I call this one combed calf. It looks combed. I've never seen a calf that looked healthier and more robust. But you should know that these calves really struggle because all summer long they've been putting their food energy, if you will, into growing bone and muscle and just plain growing. Not a whole lot of energy goes into fat storage. So come a difficult winter or even before that, a difficult journey through the insect persecuted summer, the calves can really struggle with that. They just haven't accumulated enough fat and that's not a good thing. With their mothers, they learn how to do cratering. And so in the boreal forest, they will use their hooves and paw through the snow and dig for lichens. And that's what my friend, the late Rial St. Jalais is showing us here. And they love these lichens that are so, uh, so important to their winter diet, especially. Part of the storytelling of all this is, is part of what I experienced with the people of this land, whom I admired so much. This is Moses, and he's holding a spear point that I found. And I'm a tracker, so I notice things that aren't quite right. And I spotted that black church spear point with its glistening dew drops on it. And I said to myself, wait a minute. And I picked it up and I gave it to Moses. He had never seen one. He nor any of his Inuit friends for decades had ever found one. Does that mean I'm a fabulous tracker? No, it means I was extraordinarily lucky. But what it also means is, I later found out, this is a Thule spear point, some 700 years old. And so what this is telling us is that on location where this point was found, a, a caribou was shot and killed, maybe, 700 years ago. So this has been going on for a long, long time. My guides didn't know at first that I knew anything. You know, I'm some lady from Vermont. As far as they were concerned, all I knew how to do was buy shoes, drive cars, and spend money. But when I spotted these wolves across on a side hill, I said to my guide, I said, you know, I'm going to try and call him in. I, I might have well have said I'm going to try and play bingo. They had no idea what I was talking about. Arr It worked. He came, he showed up, and uh, there he was. Uh, he didn't stay long. He didn't like me, but what tipped me off that he was coming was the ravens were flying right above him, as they are wont to do, and they're a partnership between ravens and wolves, and he showed up, and he looked, looked at me. He didn't like it. He left. I howled and howled and howled. He would not come back, but guess what happened? The ravens came to me and followed me as I made my way back to my guide, who was then on the ground writhing with laughter and tears were streaming down his eyes. And I said, are you okay? He said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, you are the hunter now. And if you don't stop this, I'm going to wet my pants. <laughs> and on another occasion, same guide, I said, boy, you see that Arctic fox about a mile away? What do you suppose we uh, 
you know, it, it, let me see if I can't get to it. He didn't believe I could, but this is what I did. So this is not to brag on what I did or what I could do. This is simply to say, this is the geography of hope. This is a landscape full of riches beyond imagination. And all you've got to do is look and listen and be there. And oh, by the way, let's take care of it. Huh? I love this statistic. In spring and summer of 2018, a female Arctic fox journey from Svalbard in Norway to Ellesmere Island in northern Canada. Her trip took 76 days, covering a distance of nearly 2,744 miles. At times, she was traveling more than 95 miles per day. Nature is extraordinary. What are we doing destroying these animals? I love the Arctic foxes, and whenever the opportunity presents itself, I, I like to uh, celebrate them in all their seasons. That little pup with the sand in its nose is adorable. And these are red foxes, which are increasingly seen in more and more parts of the Arctic. Now, they've always been there, but they do appear to be going more and more north and, and uh, maybe even having uh, a deleterious impact on Arctic foxes. This is called a cross fox. So this is a color phase of red fox. And this also is a color phase of red fox, otherwise known as silver or black fox. Again, you know, I said, gee whiz, what do you think we could take that picture? And they, my, I had two guides that day, they were incredulous when I came back with this on my camera. And I might add, in my heart, I came back with this in my heart. I call this the belted Galloway bunnies. <laughs> the only shelter there was that boulder. This is a funny one. This uh, young uh, bull was with another one. And this was brown boy and the other one's white boy. And they were, uh, they were aware that I was near and he didn't like what he smelled, but he wasn't scared enough to run away. So I started grunting like a mature bull and I put my hands above my head like antlers and I put a white conch handkerchief in my throat like a mane and I just started sounding like a bull saying, hey, what's going on? Well, that was convincing. So they started duking with one another. Hey, big guy, see what we got. We're going to be like you someday, so watch. Out. Isn't that fun? But you know what? All of a sudden, they smell me again. And look at the expression on their faces, especially white boy. White boy is just, what is that? It's not a bull caribou, I guarantee it. This bull is pitching that nostril shut. See it? I've never seen that before or since. Extraordinary. He didn't like what he smells, I don't think. Now this one here is doing a classic caribou alarm thing, you know. They don't like what they smell. They don't like what they see. They will sometimes just spread their legs and pee. That's what he's doing. But what he's doing here is he's licking his muzzle, endeavoring to get the scent molecules to adhere to his nose better so he can interpret their meaning with greater accuracy. He's not sure about me. The antlers are a blast and, you know, <laughs> here they're covered in velvet and here the velvet's coming off and that's natural. And the velvet is, is a system of, of covering uh, that, that protects capillaries and, and uh, uh, means of blood uh, supporting the growing antler and bringing nourishment to that growing antler. You can see this is the inside of velvet. You can see uh, the pattern of uh, nutrition pathways, if you will. And then later on, the redness of their antler becomes more mahogany. And so newly shed bull uh, caribou antlers are, are, are this color. Gorgeous, just gorgeous. I call this one double bull. What are the chances of that? There are two bulls absolutely on top of one another, and there's two there, not one.
too. Their noses are covered with fur to protect them from the severe climate in which they live and must forage. And so they're the only deer in the world that has a fully furred nose like this. And here's a close up. You can also see the pebbled lips, the textured lips that assist them with grasping onto things and gathering their brows and the butts and such. Their tracks are really unique. They're broad and wide and sort of like musk oxen tracks they are very circular. But boy, what's really different, as you'll see in a minute, are the dew claws and their feet are marvelously able to support them as they run through very rough terrain, very wet terrain, very icy terrain even, not a problem. In the summer, the bottoms of their hooves are flat and spongy and soft and pliable and provide great traction, but look at the dew claws above the hooves. I call them uber dews. that's my name for them. They're massive, there's no other deer in the world that has dew claws like that. And I've observed them running where the hoof steeply angled and the dew claws engaging more with the substrate, adding to the effect of the claw of the uh, hooves themselves, providing what I call four wheel drive. And then you can see that the wearing of all the rocks and hard ground in the summer kind of keeps the edges of the hooves worn. But with winter, those edges sharpen and elongate, and the underside of the hoof becomes concave, perfectly set up for digging, which they must do to find food in the boreal farms. Some of the neighbors of caribou make the whole adventure all the more endearing. The ptarmigan are some of my favorites. I love talking ptarmigan. They're beautiful birds, cousins to our rough grouse. And they love, this one thinks I'm something hot. He's crowing, he's wondering, mm, I don't know, is she really gonna get together with me or what? <laughs> and then here's something especially unique. What this ptarmigan is doing is it's got a new young stem of the plant that it's eating. In this case, I think dwarf birch in its mouth, maybe willow, uh, in its beak, and it's not using the beak to cut the bud away. It's actually putting the bud or the plant part into the beak and then using a sharp, sudden twist of the head, it breaks the plant part with the movement of its head. It doesn't bite the bite, it, 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 it simply breaks it, it's remarkable. The boreal forests where all of our caribou go, including the Alaskan caribou of the coastal plain, is where it's at for them. And it's, oh, I might also add where it's at for the planet. One third of all the trees on planet Earth, you know, a uh, huge, huge impact on our carbon sequestration and, and our water systems and everything. And we are squandering this resource. Uh, I, maybe during the Q&A, you can ask me to share a statistic on that. But here, from the lower right, roughly one inch above the screen edge, all the way through the center of the picture, all the way through, and, you know, and exiting, you know, at about 10 o'clock, are caribou. And this is part of the Leaf River herd, uh, which when I first was studying them was you know, 450, 500,000 strong. Unbelievable. The boreal forest uh, insulates, it shelters, and it feeds caribou all over the world. It also serves the planet, as I've said, as a huge carbon storehouse, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it in the soil. It's beautiful. I, I'm just so uh, thrilled by it. It's I really like the mix of the boreal forest, the taiga, and the tundra, the barrens. It's all one incredible wild world that we really need to work together now to save every bit of it we can as soon as we can.
and here you are in Alaska. It's an extraordinary world, and the caribou must have it, and so must others. You know, the, the trees themselves are worthy uh, associates in this thing called life. This is black spruce in Alaska, and this is tamarack in northern Quebec, and all oh, these are tamarack. That's a male flower, the yellow flower bud, a uh, flower cone, cone flower on the left, and then the female on the right with the bead of moisture on it. Just extraordinary, you know. Is this the barrens that nobody thinks is worth looking at or loving? I don't think so. And then there's the boreal forest, you know, along the waterway. So extraordinary. The tamaracks and black spruce, and white spruce when you're in Alaska. Just beautiful inhabitants. This is a selfie I took, almost broke my neck jumping over those rocks to get here, but I just love the color of tamaracks. I call it the second fall. You know, long after the colorful leaves are gone, this is still happening. And under each tree's overarching branches is a whole ecosystem. It's a whole world. It's a whole diversity of niches in which plants and insects and animals can make a living, often in a very, very severely uh, challenged environment. In all appropriate humility, I'm inspired to take these pictures in part to celebrate caribou and all the remarkable habitats this species is surely central to. I'm also deeply troubled by the lack of coordinated and effective conservation planning across the whole of North America that would, once and for all, completely protect these remaining vast wilderness habitats. I am compelled to document what is inestimably precious here. The caribou embodies the raw, snow-filled, and dazzling purity of another time, a time before our species' ruinous enterprise. Oh, but you know what? Animals know this. If they don't figure this out, they die. It's as simple as that. The best way to save energy is not use it. So what are we doing out there with all of our various industrial exploits, our roads, our snowmobiles, our, you know, all this stuff, we are disturbing them with a capital D and that costs them precious energy. And then their neighbors too are ill set up for our disturbances, our poaching, our, you know, all the things we do out there that compromise their existence. The Canada lynx, the Canada lynx kittens in secure den sites, which can ill afford to have roads, seismic lines, you know, which bring in more predators. It, it's all connected and it, it's all, it's all very disturbing. Lynx habitat in the West anyway, wants to be like this, wants to be old growth with lots of coarse woody debris and mix ups of trees and that's just wonderful because kittens can be deep inside there and they're safe. Martins, American Martins, both east and west, a real, a real champion of the boreal forest. So we're going to take a journey. We've uh, left the east, we've left the boreal forest and the boreal caribou. Now we're getting into the Mackenzie River area and the Mackenzie Mountains, and we're going to look at mountain caribou. And so my camp here is at, you know, over 7,000 feet, and this is what it's like. It's gorgeous. They're caribou that make vertical movements up and down these mountains. They're what we call sedentary. They don't migrate great distances, but they move up and down with seasonal habitats that work for them. To get around these habitats with all my heavy camera gear, uh, my guides uh, gave me my choice of horses. So the back horse is carrying my camera gear and front horse is carrying me. And these horses are 17 hands tall. You needed a crane to get onto them. But I, I grew up in Amish country, so horses are 
part of my life, and I was thrilled and grateful. And the caribou were tall, like the horses. I call them the Maasai warriors of caribou in North America. They're tall and long-legged, and their antlers are massive, and they're just extraordinary animals. And these are a couple bulls, and this is where they live. Oh, oh, this is not good, you see, because this is September and I'm in a t-shirt and it's hot. It's in the 70s and you'll notice there's no snow fields up there in the cirques. There's nothing in the way of residual snow and there should be. And as you all know, the western boreal forest, the western mountains, the western Arctic is really struggling more with rising temperatures than any place. This is in Denali, same thing. The lack of suitable snow fields is really a problem for these animals. And uh, if they're seeking uh, relief from insects which persecute them in ways that you and I cannot even imagine in a warming world with more insects, more weeks of insects, all the rest, it's a disaster. But if there's no snow, in which to find relief from insects, no snow in which to keep cool. Uh, it, it, it really trashes their energy budget. Yeah, these, these bumps all over this bull are warble flies. And I'm not going to get into that now, but I will highly recommend that you Google that and learn about warble flies. Warble flies and bot flies both are absolutely the worst for caribou. They torment them, they're frightened by them, and they do considerable harm. Oh boy, you see all these lakes and ponds and tarns, oh, the permafrost underneath that formed a catchment that held water, it's going, it's gone. It's, I've seen this happen in the 15, almost 16 years I've been going there. I've seen water body after water body look like this everywhere I go. Oh, and let's just pause for a minute and remember where this is all coming from, you see, because climate change is real and what we do out there contributes to it, period. So the only way to stop it is twofold. Support the organizations that are working to create meaningful structures to stop our bad behaviors and support wildlife but also stop, stop some of our bad behaviors. It's as simple as that. We don't have to drive as much as we do. This is a, a quote from a powerful author. I highly recommend it's in the bibliography that you'll get from Hillary. Developing countries argue that they should not be slowed down by environmental restrictions that might hinder their industrial growth. As astonishing as it is to those of us who are watching our inheritance begin to melt away, there are those who see this destruction of this irreplaceable world as an opportunity. Commercial flights arrive daily in the North, filled with those from mining, oil, and gas companies who are eager to exploit the riches below the melting ice. Sheila Watt-Clotier is Inuit. She's from Kajuwak, which is a community, the last sort of major uh, Inuit town where I used to go in Quebec before launching off into the tundra. And she is an amazing spokesman for Inuit peoples all over the world. And uh, you, you should really check out this book. Yeah, the right to be called. I, I, <laughs> I wanted to have the right to be called and I sure got it here. This is my next adventure in the Cambridge Bay area and also a Victoria Island area um, in Canada. Uh, and it, you know, it's easily 40 below. And, uh, but this is where I'm to see uh, one of the more threatened herds in North America the uh, dolphin and union caribou herd. And what's causing that is these, the sea that they must cross to get from Victoria Island, for example, to the mainland where they winter, 
It doesn't freeze on time. It doesn't freeze solidly enough. They sometimes are just plain impelled to get out there and get going and they drown. And it's, it's horrible. And here they are, they're lovely animals. They remind me of Piri caribou, which are also very endangered, more so even. And uh, they're lit up here by that lovely, lovely angled sunlight of the uh, spring, or no, this is fall. The fall uh, setting sunlight is just uh, extraordinary. So what's causing the decline of the caribou? Are the wolves the bad guys? Those are wolf tracks. Those are compressions in the snow next to my muckle track. And there are the wolves. And are they the bad guys? Should we be seeking to quote, control the wolves, to manage the wolves so the caribou and musk oxen will do better? No, they've been in a partnership for a long time, but there's still a lot of people out there, uh, you know, from all walks of life, uh, native and non-native, that hate wolves and want to get rid of them. And so if you're a wolf, you better watch your back. And we've got to deal with that. We who care about wildlife and care about wildlife habitats need to work on helping our neighbors understand the role of predators better. They're essential for the well-being of ecosystems, no question about it. Is she dying because she's being killed by wolves every other day? No, she may be dying because of what we do out there. But before I go there, let me just say with all the respect and reverence in my heart that the long, long, centuries long tradition of hunting caribou by indigenous peoples in the North is really quite something. And this is a true story and uh, translated here by Serge Bouchard. And it's about uh, an Inu. Again and again, he returns to the beauty and bounty of the life of a caribou hunter. The caribou is the presiding spirit of his story. Caribou meat gives strength and courage, and it also gives ease and contentment. In answer to a question about when and where to hunt, I love this. He says casually, the caribou would decide. And then he goes ahead and does all the things he has to do to be ready for the caribou's decision. This is an Inuit, uh, sort of like a Zuni fetish. This is in deepest respect and honor of the caribou and what they give us in our world, our food, our clothing, other materials that are essential for well-being in a brutally cold world. That this is this is made out of the walrus ivory, by the way. Isn't that extraordinary? And it's not about killing caribou. I, I have to say the truly traditional, truly ethical, loving uh, native peoples that I have come to know over the years have been all, all the same. They've all derived great joy from the meat that they've harvested and the degree to which they can share that with community members, especially the elders. And this is Moses, and we've come to this uh, stone, arrangement of stone trail markers showing that for hundreds of years, the way to go across this Arctic terrain to find caribou was to follow these. This is a this is a relatively new science, and I have to say I was floored by it. And in the bibliography, which you will receive, you'll get the reference for this. You can never replace the caribou. Inuit experiences of ecological grief from caribou declines. And so what that is, is these peoples, when they are in an area where caribou have declined so much that they were restricted from hunting, they've lost their way. They have lost their culture, their connectivity with their culture for hundreds of years, their elders, you know, their grandparents, uh, their children don't get to participate in these 
ways of life that have been so integral to their being. It's, it's devastating. Again, the big bad wolf that Ray's leg urinated on that musk oxen horn. Did that, is that what killed that musk oxen? No, probably not. What I found in my research in uh, parts of Alaska and, and parts of the Northwest Territories is uh, there, there are animals that die out there, whole animals that just perish because their energy budget is shot. Well, I, I, I love this man. I love his books. I've read them all. This is Seth Katner, and I love how he put this. Ramboing caribou. A modern local slang for chasing down animals has never felt like hunting to me. Shooting at animals is simple. Hunting well and respectfully is incredibly difficult. I guess I'm old. I learned the old ways from Howie and other old timers back in a different time. I learned walking the tundra or, or snowshoeing hard behind hills and along draws, crouching down, sneaking closer until finally peering over a rise and then lying there in the snow, staring, intently watching as the caribou feed, deciphering which animals are running or limping or nursing or fat, and then aiming carefully and shooting. Those musk oxen, I'm sad to tell you, are being chased by a snowmobile. That should be forbidden in any culture, period. I wish I had some heroes, one or two people self-aware enough to be bigger than their smallest hungers, even just one person to follow through this battlefield between humans and the other creatures trying to live on this planet. Again, this is Seth Kantner. That's, that's it right there. Because if you run these animals again and again and again, and you harvest one or two and you take them back to the village, well, that's very nice. But in the meantime, all the animals that you ran again and again and again over months of time, you have stolen from them they may not make it through the winter. They, they may not have sufficient fat reserves to make it. Some may experience the loss of their calves. They become orphans. Do you expect that they're gonna make it out there? The answer is no. Wolverines, this is an animal that we don't always understand. I love them. They've proven in recent research to not only be not loners and villainous and mean and nasty animals, they're incredible parents. And uh, yeah, the bad names these animals enjoy rest not so much on the actual damage they inflict on man, but rather on the fact that they're so difficult to catch or kill for we detest what we cannot subdue. And this is a catch of you know, trappers, food, and uh, pelts. They're, they're bolt cutters for teeth. They're nature's ultimate cleanup squad. They're essential in the big wild, wild world in which they live, and they're, they're so cool. I highly recommend you look at a book called The Wolverine Way by Douglas Chadwick. The right to be cold? You betcha. This one has the right to be cold, and I, I think so. Because in the lower 48, especially, the Rocky Mountains and their gradual loss of suitable high elevation denning habitat buried in the snowpack is a disaster for female wolverines and the security of their offspring. This one, too, chased by well. Chased by snowmobiles. He came by me at 75 feet. He wasn't a threat to me. He was scared to death. But what do you suppose is happening to his energy budget? These guys are doing much better. In Alaska, this is off the Arctic National Refuge in Kaktovik. These mama and her two uh, cubs are dining on provided bowhead whale um, 
harvest remains that the villagers put out there and the bears, dozens and dozens and dozens of them do well with that tremendous bounty of food. Look at the size of those bones. So they're fat and happy. But, you know, this is just one population of polar bears in the world. There's another story that I, it haunts me to this day to share this, but there was a female, a collared female and a cub that swam nine days before they could land on something in the way of ice on the ice pack. They swam for nine days for a total distance of over 430 miles. She made it, but the cub drowned. You know, in, in this Geography of Hope series, you've had the best of the best talk about polar bears, and I will simply reiterate what they have shared. It's still possible for us to make a difference, but we've got to make a difference right now on climate change and on conservation in that order. I'm just going to let us relax for a minute here and just enjoy the biodiversity that's all just inches tall in this so-called barren and desolate world called the Arctic and, you know, in the boreal forest, you know, it's incredible. Lots of food there. This is cloudberry. In the Eastern Arctic, they call it bake apple. And it really does taste like a baked apple. It's wonderful. Bilberry. This, this is a keystone species. Uh, old willows. I mean, there are 80 plus species in Alaska. And there are eight or nine or 10, depending on who you want to uh, rely upon in the North Slope. But this is a tree and this plant could be 50 years old and it's growing. It's lying flat to the ground as well it might because in the winter when those abrading ice driven winds scour across it, 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 it just can't make it unless it's hugging the ground. And then comes spring. These are the catkins, the blossoms that are visited by bumblebees, for example. This is the first flower action for them. And you can see across the whole landscape, the orange color of willows that is such a keystone in the Arctic National Refuge here, the Brooks Range. Throughout, really, I'm not going to limit it to the refuge. And so the willows are really amazing. And they offer so much to wildlife, ptarmigan, bumblebees, flies, you know, of course, caribou, moose, musk oxen, they're all there. These yellowish uh, fecal pellets on the left are ptarmigan pellets. That's Arctic willow there. And look at the browse pressure on this uh, plant. Richardson willow, I believe. That's a ptarmigan in Alaska. This is a ptarmigan in Alaska, and he thinks I might be something special. He's in a willow here. You can see that, see the catkins and everything. And I'm talking to him, and his uh, bride is at the bottom, and she's got a clutch of eggs somewhere, but she's having no parts of me. She's out of there. This is all for them. It's all part of the world that they inhabit. And we might walk over that and never see it, but there it is. Felt leaf willow. Ollis Murray, in his biological report on caribou, described a caribou that he watched uh, eating willow buds, new stems, and leaves. Quote I watched caribou spend considerable time at a willow bush on the open sandbar. When the animal had finished and traveled on, the willow was examined, and an alder was found growing within it. The limbs of the two shrubs 
intermingle. The caribou had neatly picked off the willow buds and catkins, but left the alder twigs untouched. Not extraordinary. So you can see the browse pressure here on this willow. Of course, the Arctic wouldn't be the Arctic without the lichens. And I mean, there's several lichens happening here and you got to like them. <laughs> and those uh, tube-like lichens are, are called worm, um, excuse me, uh, dead man's fingers is a common name for them. And they're extraordinary. I mean, just a few inches of ground is just bursting with life. And I made a, I made a, a deal with myself. I was going to celebrate mushrooms one year because you know i i'd seen myself how caribou really go out of their way for mushrooms and uh there it is they're extraordinary and they're everywhere you just have to look and caribou know where they are i call this one pancake mushroom and that's something Ah, and the Arctic National Refuge, why it's so important on the coastal plain for the, for the mother caribou that are going to be birthing their young, thousands of them, all within, you know, just a few days of one another. That uh, cotton grass sedge or tussock sedge is where it's at. Uh, those flowers, especially just prior to this, when they're still kind of dark and greenish, are really full of essential nutrients for those lactating does. And then later on, they look like this, a classic cotton grass name. They're, they're just so beautiful. And then there's woolly loustwort, and this is in the woolly phase. And this is like a greenhouse, this wildflower. And here's what it looks like when it's, when it's blooming. And caribou, according to Debbie Miller, who's one of my favorite authors uh, writing about Alaska wildlands and, and the Arctic refuge in particular, she, she talks about them as being ice cream flowers for caribou. I mean, I don't know how anybody could be bored with this life. I have no idea. Look at that. Gentian in the shelter of an antler. I don't know how to say this, but in 10 words or less, I, I soon recognized wherever I went in caribou country that there was a really powerful way that their remains, long deceased, would be absorbed in the land and part of the land in what I would describe as simply beautiful. So I decided to kind of get at that It is of the land that was supported by the land, goes back to the land. Look at that. That's a scapula, willow, lichens. I, I, I know of no other animal whose presence upon passing on is so beautifully absorbed in the land in which it lived. I, I know of no other, I, I, what can I say? Crowberry. A vertebrae. Skull with antlers attached. It goes back and then of course the antlers themselves are mineralized and they go back to the land and produce all kinds of wonderful after effects for those that uh, come in contact with them and ingest them in some cases. These uh, antlers are being chewed on by arctic foxes and wolves and by caribou themselves for their source of minerals. And you can see the chewing. This has been worked over by a bear. Those are bear claw marks. And then, of course, the human hunters 
have their way of honoring the caribou. This is on Victoria Island. Extraordinary. So as we close in the show, we are wild about wilderness. And it wouldn't be right to not say just a few words about bears, grizzlies, or in this case, brown bears, south of the refuge. I call this one the Brothers Karamazov. You know, you'll see movies about brown bears and they dub in these horrific sounds of yelling and screaming. That's nonsense. These animals are playing. They know one another. They're biffing around. They're just, they're like teenagers. They can't help themselves. This is Big Mama. And I hung out with her for two days. On one day, I watched her eat from late morning when I first started hanging out with her till late afternoon when I had to leave. I watched her eat catch and eat 37 cent. She's really good at it. She's unique. She has a scar on her nose and that interesting part on her head. Here she is down periscope. This is what it's like if you're a chum salmon or a pink and you're swimming by, you might see this. Uh Oh, not good. There you go. This is such a boon to those bears. And we need to keep these wild places wild, all the way up to the Admiralty Islands, all the, all the wild places that we can where this salmon phenomenon happens. We need to protect that. That's Big Mama. Notice she's got a catch there. Notice the eye of the fish in her, framed in her claws. <laughs> What's on her lips? Hmm. Well, what's on her lips is pink uh, row, you know, eggs. But what she's doing here, she's stripping the skin off. And after a while, they catch so many salmon, they don't really eat the fish, but they eat the fat, rich skin and the eggs and oftentimes the head. And of course, everybody is benefiting from this. It's not just the bears. It's the eagles. It's the weasels. It's everybody. It's this gull. Watch. There you go. <laughs> I call this one hairdo. Extraordinary. Now this is Big Mama at the end of my second day with her. And I had tears in my eyes because I was leaving and I would not be seeing her again. And I really had grown very fond of her. And she went into the woods and I thought, oh, she's leaving. Okay. She didn't say goodbye, but what did I expect? But oh no, she went in the woods a bit, she turned around, she came back to the edge and she lay where she could keep an eye on me. Well, at this point, I definitely had tears in my eyes and I could hardly focus the camera because look what happened next. She went to sleep. So as we conclude, let's certainly think about the refuge and what we're doing in Northern Alaska, the Brooks Range. Yeah, tough world. Those animals have to negotiate the valleys that they come to reach if they're lucky. The journeys back and forth, both spring, early summer, and then again in later in the summer and fall tremendous journeys, the longest journeys of any land animal on earth. Look at the trails etched into the rock on that side hill. Those are caribou trails over time. If you look closely, uh, well, you can't really see them. Yeah, sorry. Right here is caribou. <laughs> This is a nose to tail trail. This is to conserve energy. When the snow is really deep, the caribou will walk right behind one another and save energy and take turns leading. Look at all those trails. This is the wonder of life. Look at them. And there's caribou in the dead center of the picture there. <coughs> it's a beautiful world. And it doesn't need oil or gas lines or size of exploration or any of that. 
Look at all the birds alone that use this place. And the journeys they take. Just incredible. I've been here in a couple different seasons and I, I just have to keep hoping I can come back. Willows again, look at them. And of course, ptarmigan, they love the willows. This is a, a quote that I often think about when I'm really trying to defend why beauty is important. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. I think I first heard that in grade school. It resonated, it made sense to me. Would that it could make sense to all of our neighbors in the human world. This is part of that. To destroy it is a sin uh, beyond imagining. These are our neighbors. E. O. Wilson says it very best. The living world is in desperate condition. It is suffering steep declines in all levels of its diversity. Only a major shift in moral reasoning with greater commitment to the rest of life can meet this greatest challenge of the century. Wild lands are our birthplace. And I'll conclude with this wonderful line from Aulus Murian. I'll have to say that right at his side is Marty so while he said this, she was with him. So I will credit this to both of them. I want to roam over these plains myself, like the caribou, and feed on lichens, face the winds, and travel on and on. May you all travel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. That was incredible. Um, I have been kind of looking at the chats um, in our Q&A and people definitely had a lot of appreciation for all of your beautiful photography and the images that you captured. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. If you know, Alaska Wilderness League does try to protect all these places that Sue is talking about in Alaska. And if you would like to help us keep these wildlands wild, um, right now, if you become a monthly donor, you can get a free Alaska Wilderness League camp cup, um, plastic free, and we would be happy to have you join our League of Monthly Donors. Um, the, there will be a link in the email that we send. It's alaskawild.org slash cup. And with that, I know that we've gone a little long enjoying all of this amazing imagery and the stories. So I will just quickly transition to questions that people have asked. Um, I have just a few of them. A lot of it was just commentary, Sue, on how much people loved your work. So. Um, one of the questions that people asked is around um, the cutting down of the boreal forest. The boreal is not actually, Alaska Wilderness League works on the Tongass and the boreal is more in the Northern parts of the Arctic. Do you wanna just say a couple words about that or if, if you're familiar with that particular problem at all? Well, of course the boreal forest spanning the entire circumpolar boreal forest parts of the world is 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 a vast resource and in alaska you know it would be where the caribou would go to after leaving you know the coastal plain and, and getting down into 
the forest for all the resources it provides. I mentioned that we squander the boreal forest and I'm not gonna mention any names, but there is one toilet paper company that um, is responsible for, for cutting a million acres of virgin boreal forest in the Canadian Northeast for its non, uh, you know, non-recyclable toilet paper. And, and in today's world, that's, that's just not appropriate. It's just absolutely wrong. So there's where the power of buying can come into it. I, I will forever, never <laughs> support any paper product that isn't uh, coming from sustainable, uh, you know, sources and so on. We, we really can make a difference. And then there too, people, there tonight, if you're not a member of the Alaska Wilderness League, if you're not a member of Northeast Wilderness Trust or Keeping Track or, you know, any number of hundreds of organizations that are on the front lines with these issues, please join us because more, more of you helping us makes it, makes it better, makes it stronger. And that's what we need right now. It's an emergency out there. We need it. Um, quick follow-up question. You're being pressed to name the company. <laughs> I don't know if you want to, so that people can take I action, will. or if you don't want to, that's okay. Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I'm a reluctant to. Okay. You, Alaska Wilderness think we'll look this up and we'll try to share it with our supporters. How about that? You can later? Google it. it it's yeah. out there. Yep. It's out okay. There. Cool. Um. So next question about the parmid, oh God, I'm gonna pronounce the name wrong. Parmigen, parmigens, is that the birds that are, um, that you featured so heavily? I know it starts with a P, but I cannot Parmigen. pronounce it now. Um, thank you. They, I believe that they change their colors throughout the year and that is explaining the variation, but can you talk a little bit about all of the various coloration differences between them and how they end up if it's like different types of them or if it's a just range of seasonality that's changing their colors. I am not an ornithologist. I'm really a mammal biologist, but I will say uh, with my respectful uh, knowledge that I've obtained over the years, the ptarmigan, uh, the two species that I'm most familiar with, the willow ptarmigan and the rock ptarmigan will have different colorations depending on where they live and and that's part of how we identify them so that's sort of their physical physical id feature um they uh you know they, they must turn white to be to be white in winter but that's you know so there's other adaptations that they do as well they get full full feathered leggings on their legs and the soles of their feet, unlike rough grass, which grow cone-like fringes on their feet to enlarge their feet like snowshoes, ptarmigan don't need that, but their feet are covered with this interlocking uh, latticework of feathers that act like the ultimate snowshoes. And really, and then the tips of the feathers on the edges of the foot, per my hypothesis, actually expand, flare outwards and, and who knows, significantly enlarge the surface area of the foot just for that. So it's amazing. Uh, I, I highly recommend people learn about ptarmigans. And they have very comical sounds, you know, uh, that you just have to start giggling when you hear them. All right, there, and myself. Um, I was just looking for additional Q and A's and um, anyone who's interested in the companies, you can look through the chat. There's a little conversation going on about that. Um, I, this, I know that you love Wolverines and the discussion of feet was something that I think is kind of cool about Wolverines. Do you want to talk for a second about the Wolverines going through the snow and how their feet adapt to snow as well? Yeah, well, they have they have proportionately big feet, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, of, of all their muscle and uh, cohorts, they, they, they proportionately have big feet. Um, 
you know, I they're kind of odd because they have naked feet, what I would call naked feet with naked pads and toe pads, which uh, you would think in the environment in which they live would be more obscured with fur than that. But apparently they don't need it. But what, what I will say about wolverines that people don't know, that's only recently been learned, is that they are not only not mean and nasty and vicious and loners, they're some of the most extraordinary animals on the planet for their relationship with their kind. A, a resident male wolverine living within his home range, which might be three or four or five hundred square miles big, sharing that range with some females. He breeds them. They raise his offspring. So separate offspring, separate breedings, separate females. When they leave their mothers, they go hang out with dad. No one knew that. So you can read that in Douglas Chadwick's book, uh, The Wolverine Way. Uh, it's just amazing. You know, not even apes do that. Huh. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the, all of the questions and so forth are going on um, for our audience members who are interested in the Q&A. So that's on the more left side of your screen. It should have like a little number with a red bubble there. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about how much patience you need to, to find these animals and get some of this phenomenal photography like lynx babies? I want to know how long I have to wait around <laughs> to well, find lynx babies. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I have, uh, I think, maybe three total pictures of lynx babies in their dens. And in every occasion, I was with other biologists and we were, you know, the, the, the mothers were collared and, and so we were checking. Okay. One, one of the coolest pictures I have, I took in Maine actually and uh, back when Maine proved that we not only had lynx in Maine contrary to what some Rocky Mountain biologists were trying to say but we actually had more lynx in northern Maine than any place in the lower 48 way oh. more nah, 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 nah. so you know I, I I as a biologist I've had wonderful opportunities with cougars and cougar kittens and and on and on so one doesn't necessarily wait for them the way you can caribou or even those brown bears in a situation. Um, so it's it's uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. But a lot of it too is just learning how to sit and be still, and and learning how to track so that you can interpret where uh, trails are converging, where you might oppor opportunistically sit. You know, so 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 my biggest uh, my biggest uh, experience with success has always happened because I managed to do that right, and uh, you know doesn't always happen, but it's fun when it does. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna check our Q and A one last time because I know that it's quite late. Um, so there was one question about um, how safe the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is from new oil leasing. Um, and the answer to that, a very brief answer, is that there are there is still one lease sale that is mandated because of the um, the because of the bill that was passed during the Trump administration that mandated lease sales in the Arctic Refuge. And there has already been the one failed lease sale in which almost no one bid on it. it um, and so unless we do more to protect the Arctic refuge from the next lease sale that's coming and from drilling, we it still is vulnerable. And so Alaska Wilderness League is fighting super hard to make sure that the Arctic refuge is not ever drilled on, that no seismic testing moves forward and definitely sign up for our email list if you're not a part of them already to find out when the your voice is needed because there are public comment periods and other moments of pressure that we will continue to act upon to keep this place protected. Um, it's the reason Alaska Wilderness League was founded and we will fight to do whatever it takes to keep that place safe. If I may, I would like to add to that by saying that, you know, with E.L. Wilson as, as my favorite 
uh, sort of Olus Murray and, and Marty Murray mentor uh, of, of recent times, I'm very persuaded that half earth is where we need to go now in our town forests, in our villages, in our counties, in our country, in our world. We have got to aggressively define where half earth is going to be. And that is nobody, no plans, no development, no human infrastructure. That seems extreme, but that's what has to happen for biodiversity to make it through all this. And uh, so in that respect, I'll say that the Arctic National Refuge is definitely a major target area, but I would include the whole North Coast of Alaska. I'm not stopping there. The so-called petroleum, you know, I, I it, it makes me really nervous to hear hear that those other areas aren't protected or even thought to be protected in the same way. And that's where we should really try and make a difference. And that's where I know the Wilderness Lake is definitely. You know, Debbie Miller's book, uh, you, you, you know, members of, of the Alaska Wilderness League can, can certainly learn more about some of the writings that Debbie and multiple other members of the Wilderness League have put together, not just on the Arctic Refuge, but on the whole coast. And um, a follow-up question was the reason that the Lisa was failed. And there are some great articles coming out um, recently that have been talking about the effectiveness of the pressure of the campaign by the Gwich'in Steering Committee, who's a huge partner of Alaska Wilderness League, um, in pressuring insurance companies and other companies to not drill in the Arctic, not insure drilling in the Arctic Refuge, to, and then banks to not invest in drilling the Arctic Refuge. So we're working on a whole additional angle of pressuring companies to not support drilling, as well as pressuring the administration and Congress to protect the Arctic Refuge, because again, we're gonna do whatever we need to to protect this place. Um, so uh, the articles have been coming out talking about how this is actually something that's been effective. Bill McKibben attributed some of these successes to people standing up and protesting against um, Arctic Refuge drilling. And there was recently a CNN article about this. So we all share a couple of the recent pieces that have come out. There was another one that just came out today on Grist that I think it's today that talks about people actually leaving the oil industry. So young people starting jobs are really not, they're avoiding oil industry jobs. Um, there's definitely momentum building to get away from oil and it's really encouraging. And we just keep need to keep fighting to make sure Alaska is not the place where they win. So Thank you. And um, with that, I know that it's getting kind of late. So I just wanted to, again, appreciate everyone who is supporting our work, everyone who's tuning in to learn more about Wild Alaska. And um, definitely all of our donors, our Wild Star monthly donors and our donors who just make all of this work possible. So thank you so much, everyone. Sue, thank you for this fantastic presentation. Everyone have a great day. We will be having another Geo of Hope in uh, December. So look for the emails and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.